Hello, this is Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson today with the Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. We, of course, here in Paris uh, for the Versailles summit. Um, there was a statement that came out after the first day of that summit calling on Russia to cease its military action in Ukraine, withdraw. Um, but given that Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, was speaking uh, about how Russia, in his view, isn't attacking Ukraine, how optimistic are you that Russia will even he heed this call? I believe that the unity of the European Union was once again demonstrated uh, in Versailles during this informal European Council, especially in terms of understanding that on the 24th of February with the brutal uh, aggression and invasion of Ukraine, Russia has violated all the principles of international law and the international order as we know it. Therefore, our uh, strong appeals to stop this aggression are consistent with what we have been doing very efficiently over the past two weeks. Um, after the talks between Minister Kuleba and Minister Lavrov uh, through the mediation of, of Turkish Minister Çavuşoglu in Antalya, we can only conclude after the uh, statements of Russia's foreign minister that we live in two different realities. And that's why uh, we will continue uh, sending strong messages, adopting the packages of restrictive measures in order to uh, tell uh, Moscow that this is not appropriate, that this sh it should immediately stop with so many innocent casualties and people fleeing their homes in Ukraine. This is unbelievable and un unacceptable for the third decade of the 21st century in Europe. We're also hearing warnings at the same time from various quarters that Russia could be preparing some kind of false flag attack, which would demand a much stronger response. Are you concerned that Russia could be actually trying to provoke a war or a military response from the West? Well, I think that uh, strengthening of the countries who are bordering Ukraine has already occurred. This you have seen. This is an activity of uh, NATO already. Uh, we are, of course, all in the position to help Ukraine in this situation, and we have done so in uh, terms of civil protection, technical aid, acceptance of uh, refugees, also in uh, military terms to the extent to which a country of our size can do. And also we are trying to do everything we can internationally together with the package of uh, first, second and third package of sanctions in order to basically create an atmosphere where the policy would also change in Moscow. Uh, we are following everything in detail together with our partners and allies, including the entire intelligence community. On humanitarian corridors, the EU27 calling on Russia to allow safe passage out for civilians who want to leave uh, Ukraine. Have you seen any signals, though, from Russia that they are ready to engage on this? Well, what we have seen is uh, the uh, attacks on cities. Kyiv has almost 4 million people. Kharkiv is also uh, really um, highly inhabited city. Other cities which are three or 400,000 people. When you open the, the corridors for civilians to be able to leave those cities, you are sending two messages. One is that you intend to take over that city and second that you are creating an unprecedented wave of refugees uh, across, or first of all within Ukraine and then in the European Union. You have seen that more than two, two million people have already left Ukraine. There are estimates by UNHCR and the International Organization for, Migra for Migration that we may witness five million people on the road fleeing for, for, for the shelter, fleeing for security. And this is certainly something that is beyond anything that we have seen uh, since the end of the Second World War. My country, Croatia, was also a victim of aggression of greater Serbia, Milosevic's policy in the 90s, Bosnia and Herzegovina too. But altogether, we had around, I think, 600,000 refugees and displaced persons the most. Now, only in two weeks, we have already more than two million. So that's why this is going to be a, a task uh, for the extension of solidarity to the extent uh, which we have never seen before. And uh, in terms of the measures uh, targeting Russia, sanctions, uh, you and the other 26 EU leaders uh, say that you are ready to move quickly with more sanctions from the EU. Would those include energy uh, in the same way that the United States has done? 
Well, it's a rather different position. Uh, the United States has a relatively small percentage of imports of gas from Russia, and it is not the amount which will put uh, in jeopardy the um, supply of gas for, for the citizens or for the businesses. In Europe, uh, the energy dependency on Russian gas is above 40%. It varies from country to country, and I think what we are currently uh, doing is <laughs> setting up the entire alternative concept of the gas supply uh, in Europe, whether it's from the increased production domestically, whether it's import from other countries who are the gas producers, such as Norway or Azerbaijan or Libya or Algeria, or through the boats coming from uh, ships coming uh, with the liquefied natural gas. Croatia is one of the countries that does have a liqui liquefied natural gas terminal. It was done and realized in the mandate of my first government opened just over a year ago, and its capacity is 2.8. Uh, 6 uh, billion cubic meters. This is the volume sufficient enough both for our entire economy and for our households, but we would like to increase its capacities and I think the idea is now to create a new functioning grid in Europe. Of course, this all comes with expense for European economies. Um, many are worried about whether Europeans can shoulder this cost and indeed uh, whether this could cause democratic instability, such as we saw with Gilets Jaunes protests here in France, which were very much about the cost of living. Indeed, this is exactly what I said during the summit. I think these two parallel, there are three crises. One is the tragedy of the Ukrainian people, for which we are absolutely sorry and we are trying to help our Ukrainian friends. The second is the massive refugee flow. And the third one is the unprecedented spike of energy prices, whether it's gas, whether it's petrol, whether it's oil, I mean, or whether it's the electricity in turn. So the whole idea of the governments and also at the level of the European Union, and we ask the Commission to come up with proposals which would be a European solution, even a global one, in capping the energy prices, we have all turned domestically uh, into interventionist governments. I just passed this week uh, a series of measures and proposed legislative changes, a package worth more than 700 million euros in order to alleviate the pressure and the economic shock on the standard of our citizens and of our businesses. But uh, we need to have a sustainable policy and this can all only be done if we cap the prices and try to keep them to a reasonable level. Because what we witness now compared to the one year ago, you can see that the prices are sometimes 500% more or 700% uh, more. This is not uh, tenable on a long run. Just on the wider expense of this war, this crisis for Europe, would you support another EU recovery fund, uh, like the one that was launched after the COVID pandemic crisis, uh, which would include joint borrowing by all 27 member states? Well, I think that the EU next generation proved to be an excellent instrument in terms of the relaunching our economies. And also, I think one of the leverage is that is important is the use of the European Union funds, whether it's the usual multi-annual budget or whether it's the EU next generation. So this crisis with such high spike in energy prices, I think requires a joint action for that would speed up and accelerate the launch of the European economy. We are certainly in favour. In favour of joint borrowing on the international market? We are in favour of all the possible ways that can bring more uh, financial means to the EU member states that can, as quickly as possible, uh, first of all, suppress the inflatory pressures which we, are, which we are all facing and second, enable the economic recovery as soon as possible. On Ukraine's bid to start the process of joining the European Union, uh, the summit statement from the first day said that Ukraine belongs to a European family. It talks about deepening the partnership with Ukraine. But to be clear, this is not giving Ukraine candidate status straight away. When I was in Kyiv, it was in the middle of December, I signed a declaration between Croatia and Ukraine on supporting Ukraine's European perspective, European path leading towards the EU membership. And therefore, once uh, after the aggression uh, that started on the 24th of February, that the uh, President Zelensky sent a letter of uh, asking for the EU membership from uh, President Macron, the EU has acted accordingly. We passed the decision at the level of the Council to uh, ask the European Commission to prepare an opinion on this application. So the process has been triggered. 
What we did here in Versailles, we sent a strong political signal saying that we want to intensify relations with Ukraine in every single possible way that we can in order to pursue its European path. I think technologically it is due to the practice that we have so far, it's impossible to take these decisions one day after another. To give you an example, Croatia is the, the latest member of the European Union. We applied in 2003 in February and we got the candidate status in 2004, more than a year later. But so the circumstances are very different for Ukraine. Indeed, it's much indeed, more of a crisis indeed. situation. E even such a speedy decision, basically they applied the one day and in two days time there was the procedure to send the uh, request to the Commission to prepare the so-called avis of the, of the opinion. So for you it this is already is accelerated? I think we are doing everything we can in realistic terms and we want to intensify cooperation with uh, Ukraine to the extent that would first of all <coughs> cement the, parts, the path towards the European Union and intensify it in political, economic, financial and sectorial. Uh, terms uh, more intensively than it is already with the association agreement mm -hmm. and the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement which are in force. We've just got time for a very brief word about the impact of this war in Ukraine on your region, the Western Balkans. There are signs of instability, of, of Russian influence. How much of a danger do you see to the Balkans of this war? Well, I, I think uh, we have to be vigilant and careful. For us, what is the most important issue in the region is the uh, agreement which is supposed to be uh, done by uh, our friends and partners in Bosnia and Herzegovina regarding the reform of the electoral law, especially in the part of Bosnia and Herzegovina which is called the Federation, where Bosniak Muslims and Croats live. Mm -hmm. I have appealed personally to the leaders of political parties to find a solution where a just and equitable uh, electoral law is found so that the Croats uh, as constituent people can be equal and we can rectify the anomalies which exist in, since 2006. We are doing this as a friend, neighbor and a strong supporter of uh, sovereign Bosnia and Herzegovina on its way to the EU. So a gesture vis-a-vis -vis the Croats in Bosnia and Herzegovina would be an excellent step forward in the next couple of weeks. Andrei Plenkovic, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to you for watching the programme. See you soon.